they're feel extra attorney, special, and this is one of them. Doing policy so work. So thank you for joining us in person research. and for anyone watching on the live stream. Thank you for joining us virtually. I do want to take a moment just to, I apologize for not acknowledging everyone in the room, but I do want to take a moment first and foremost to acknowledge Mrs. Tamika Palmer, who has joined us, Brianna Taylor's mother. Thank you very much for being here. It is so good to have you here. I hope you enjoy the program. And um, as I said before the program got started, you are going to meet three amazing fellows. It's going to be awesome. OK. No, no pressure, fellows. Um, I also want to thank Mrs. Brenda Owens for being here. As you know, we will be. Thank you so much. We are going to present the Daryl T. Owens Community Service Award um, posthumously to our alum, J. Michael Brown. And I want to thank his family, Robin White Chisholm, and especially his son, William Brown, for being here. So thank you both so much. So I know that you want the program, but I, I just wanted to take my privilege of Dean and saying just a couple of things. Last year when we had this event, it was several weeks after the Department of Justice had released its findings about the city, um, findings in which the Department of Justice said that the city and law enforcement engaged in a pattern of unlawful and discriminatory conduct, depriving people of their constitutional liberties. The DOJ report provided multiple instances in which police used racist and dehumanizing language against black people and stated that the LMPD has practiced an aggressive style of policing, that it deploys selectively, especially against black people. And I said at that time, as the findings highlight, that we have tremendous work ahead of us to dismantle the structural racism that pervades all aspects of our legal and justice system. Yet over the past year and a half, the term structural racism has come under attack and addressing systemic racism within higher education has become illegal in too many states. The Chronicle of Higher Education has been tracking the introduction of anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion legislation. Since 2023, 82 bills in 28 states have been introduced to preclude education around diversity, equity, and inclusion, including two in this past legislative session in Kentucky. Nationwide, 12 have final legislative approval, 12 have become law, and then others have been tabled, failed to pass, or vetoed. We have since heard about equity offices at universities across Texas and Florida being wholly eliminated and personnel terminated. I purposefully used the full term, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and at Brandeis we do also like to add belonging, rather than the initials, DEI, because none of those words should be divisive and none of those words should be scary. As President Schatzel wrote to our community last month, we firmly believe that you cannot deliver a high quality university education without a diverse classroom and campus, inclusive of all demographics, identities, and ideologies. Her note continued, in short, a diverse and inclusive campus better prepares our students to lead. So when I joined the Brandeis School of Law in July of 2022, and I learned about the inaugural Brianna Taylor Lecture in Structural Inequality, I thought it was really important. But it seems so much more important now, and that's why I am so glad that you are here. Brandeis School of Law is committed to funding this annual lecture, much more importantly, the Brandeis School of Law is committed to the important principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We will continue to include discussions of implicit bias, cultural competence, and racism in our curriculum and co-curricular activities, not only because it's consistent with ABA accreditation, but because it matters and it's the right thing to do. Ensuring the ideals of equality, justice, and dignity for all people should not be divisive. Rather, it should be our common societal goal. 
Dismantling structural racism should not be a partisan issue. So I am very grateful to all of you for being here tonight and especially grateful to attorney Damon Hewitt for joining us to share his strategies and ideas to help us do this important work to overcome structure, structural inequality. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would be remiss not to thank Kyle Durbin, Tracy Cole, Jill Scoggins, and last year's Daryl T. Owens Award winner and our newest professor of practice, Lanita Baker, who helped with the many logistics for tonight's event. I also, and I wanna make sure that I don't get daggers thrown at me, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize Professor Cedric Merlin Powell, who, along with our next speaker, organized the event, developed the theme, and secured our speaker, Damon Hewitt. Professor Powell has been a member of our faculty for 31 years and has had an extraordinary impact as a teacher and as a scholar. He is also an amazing colleague and I feel so grateful that I have been able to get to know him and call him a friend. Professor Powell is retiring from Brandeis Law at the end of the school year. And while I know he is now very unhappy with me for drawing attention to him, and I am a little scared, and that's why when he told me he was sitting here, I chose a seat over there. I hope you will all join me, please, and take a moment to thank him for his outstanding contributions to Brandeis Law. Guys, if he's really angry with me later, just know I think it's still the right thing to do. It is my pleasure to introduce another colleague of mine at Brandeis Law, Dr. Laura McNeil. Professor McNeil holds both a JD and PhD in education and is a national expert in issues of access and equity in employment and education law with a particular emphasis on issues of access and equity for individuals from traditionally marginalized populations. You may recognize Professor McNeil from TV. She's appeared on CNN, MSNBC, CBS, NBC, and many others. Dr. McNeil has published extensively on the intersection of bias and the law and currently conducts anti-bias workshops for educators, students, lawyers, judges, nonprofit organizations, and various other sectors. She's received numerous fellowships, honors, and awards, and I know that we need to get to the program, so I will just highlight that her most recent publication, Integrating the Marketplace of Ideas, a new constitutional theory for protecting students' free speech rights, appears in a journal that you might have heard of, the Stanford Law Review. Dr. McNeil gave the inaugural Brianna Taylor Lecture and was instrumental in organizing tonight's event. So I am so delighted to turn the program over to her. All right, good evening. Welcome to the annual Brianna Taylor Lecture. Let me try that again. Welcome to the annual Brianna Taylor Lecture. All right. Good evening. So tonight we celebrate the legacy of the beautiful Brianna Taylor. She was a loving daughter, sister, and cherished friend to many. Her family and friends describe her as having a servant's heart and dedicating her life to helping others. She comes from a legacy of freedom fighters strong black women who embodied grace, resilience, and strength, such as Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, and her mother, Ms. Tamika Palmer, who carries on that strong tradition of advocacy. Tonight's theme is Democracy Forward, Advocacy, Empowerment, and Inclusion. The theme embodies the importance of using the law to build collective power, to dismantle structural inequality, to advance social justice, and promote equity on all fronts of society. Tonight's keynote speaker is a personal friend and advocate for us all. It's attorney Damon Hewitt. He is a preeminent civil rights attorney 
current president of the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. He has more than 20 years of civil litigation and policy experience. So just an example of the dedication of attorney Damon Hewitt, he literally was fighting the good fight, as, as John Lewis would say, the good fight in North Carolina in a courtroom, literally yesterday hopped on a plane, landed at about 420 to get to this event. And so when I say he is a modern day freedom fighter, um, I mean it in every sense of the word. Prior to joining the National Lawyers Committee, Hewitt was an inaugural executive director of the Executives Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, which is a philanthropic network of more than three dozen national and local foundation presidents focused on shifting policies, structures, and the false narratives that negatively impact our nation's sons and brothers. Through his leadership, the Alliance helped incubate, coordinate, and launch more than 200 million in collaborative grant making efforts on issues ranging from police accountability to college completion. He was also the chief liaison from the philanthropic community to the White House on policy issues impacting young men of color. You see why we picked him. <laughs> Hewitt previously worked as a senior advisor at the Open Society Foundations where he coordinated special projects including philanthropic responses to the uprisings following the police killings of unarmed black people in Ferguson, Missouri and Baltimore, Maryland. He has worked for more than a decade as an attorney as well for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Education Fund where he led the council on a variety of litigation and policy matters and supervised teams of lawyers and policy experts. He started his career as, as a Skadden Fellow, eventually leading the organization's education practice group and pioneering its efforts to address the school to prison pipeline. I met Damon through his efforts in dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Uh, we were on a coalition together and that's when I got my first glimpse of his brilliance, but more important, his dedication to civil rights. He also coordinated organization-wide litigation and advocacy efforts in response to Hurricane Katrina, establishing a satellite office in his hometown of New Orleans. In this capacity, he developed advocacy efforts on education, policing, and fair housing. One of his most important cases, Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center versus the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development catalyzed nearly 500 million in new relief for Louisiana homeowners. I think that's worth a round of applause. <laughs> Hewitt also served as the executive director of the New York Task Force on Police on Police Shootings, an entity created specifically to analyze police practices after off-duty African-American and Latino police officers were killed by fellow officers after being mistaken for criminal suspects. Uh, Hewitt appears frequently in broadcast media and quoted in public, print publications throughout the country. He's the co-author of a book that I recommend every one of you write this down and get. It's called The School to Prison Pipeline, Structuring Legal Reform. Uh, he's also published numerous articles in law journals and popular media on issues ranging from affirmative action to school discipline to progressive education reform to voting rights, police accountability, essentially anything that deals with justice and equity for all. He has been on the front line for those efforts. So without further ado, and that was a long introduction because his accomplishments are just that stellar and vast. So without further ado, uh, let's give a round of applause for our preeminent civil rights attorney, keynote speaker, Damon Hewitt. Good evening. All right, you are too kind. I'm not the man, I'm just the man sitting next to the man, sitting next to the woman. Uh, that's who I am. Um, old Robin Harris joke, if anybody remember Robin Harris, put my timer on here, because if I go over time, Cedric will have me. Um, but I probably will. Uh, but in all seriousness, thank you for having me. I want to thank uh, 
Dean Jacobs, uh, for your leadership, for your vision. When I met you just a short while ago, I just got, she's a beacon. Like, there's something special happening with your leadership uh, here. Um, I got a chance to meet uh, uh, President Schatzel, uh, and she told me a bit about uh, the efforts that she has taken on, the university has taken on, to defend diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in higher education here uh, in, in, in Kentucky. Uh, Want to thank uh, Professor Powell, obviously. 31 years, I had no idea. You're the youngest looking 31-year uh, <laughs> vet I've ever met, I have to say. Uh, doctor and professor, probably will be reverend as well, because you're a PK, uh, Laura McNeil. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure watching uh, we, we, were, we weren't baby lawyers when we met, but we were early career, right? It's just been a pleasure watching you grow and your impact grow. I think we hadn't been in touch in a while. Next thing you know, I'm doing a, a media interview, and she's like the person on set uh, who's the expert on set. Uh, fantastic. Um, Lenita Baker, who uh, you know about her, pre her relevance to the university, to the law school, but she also is an immediate past president of the National Bar Association, the organization created because the American Bar Association will not allow black people, black attorneys in. The MBA is so important. I, I, I won't tell you all the reasons why, but I've litigated cases in communities where I step in to a room, and I may be, at least early in my career, the youngest person in the room, aside from children, youngest adult, but have the highest degree of formal education. And when I would ask, are there any black lawyers in this county, the answer is no. That, that happened in many places. And so the National Bar Association chapters and affiliates around the country and the national infrastructure, they stay connected and they help connect. And it's not only black lawyers who, who should be doing the work of civil rights, obviously, but there are people who aren't just familiar with communities, but they are of the communities. And so whether it be the work we do on election protection and hopefully new partnerships on litigation, the National Bar Association is important. And your year of leadership was a stellar uh, year of leadership. I wish it could have been more, more years than one. Um, and last but not least, Ms. Tamika Palmer. Uh, we had a chance to meet uh, briefly. We chit-chatted while we uh, had dinner at an MBA mid-year conference, right? So that was about a year ago, right? Um, and try to keep in touch and, you know, uh, via text and whatnot. And your, uh, we, we, we've already, this, this, this obviously this lecture is named, series is named after your daughter. But I want to just invoke your energy and spirit, um, your grace, um, your compassion for our people and all people, and your commitment to seeking justice, knowing that justice may be a winding road that it may take many different forms. So I just want to recognize you once again for all that you have done and all that you do. It's not just about your pain, it's about your possibility and what you represent. So thank you. So friends, yes, we're under attack. We're under attack on so many fronts, enough fronts to make your head spin. I think about the conferences I would attend Early in my career, we would talk in the early 2000s, the arts about the rollback of civil rights that was coming. Well, those rights done rolled, yeah. right, in the vernacular. And so there's so many fronts where we at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law, the organization I'm proud to lead, uh, we've been very active. And we'll talk about, about some of those. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Lawyers Committee. So those of you who are of an age, or those of you who are students of history, um, think back to a year when these things happened. Elected officials obstructed justice and tried to block civil rights laws, or just laws generally, from being enforced. The President of the United States delivered a televised address about the importance of civil rights, including new voting rights laws. Black people are targeted for hate and violence by white vigilante, vigilantes and supremacists, including some in law enforcement, sometimes with uh, fatal effects. Racial justice leaders risk their lives and liberty to fight for justice. They're targeted by law enforcement, surveilled, harassed. Hundreds of thousands of people peacefully take to the streets 
and protests, and it's a multiracial coalition, an intergenerational coalition, and interfaith as well, which is also very important. What year was that? Could be a lot of different years. Any answer you give is probably <laughs> almost right. So it could have been any time in the last few or several years, right? My office in Washington, D.C. is around the corner from Black Lives Matter Plaza and just a short walk to the White House. So it certainly happened there. But the year I'm actually referencing is 1963, right? Uh, we've talked about the long, hot summer later in, in the 60s, but 63 was a pivotal year in the civil rights movement. You see, a lot of those types of things happened. George Wallace on June 11th, then governor of Alabama, stood in the schoolhouse door to physically block desegregation or integration, depending on your choice of words and paradigms and law, uh, the, of University of Alabama. Vivian, Vivian Malone, who was actually Eric Holder's sister-in-law, former A.G. Eric Holder's sister-in-law, and James Hood. That same day, President Kennedy issued a televised address, the first time a sitting U.S. president had ever issued a televised address, because it was a somewhat new medium at the time, about civil rights and civil rights legislation in particular. He spoke about how he urged Congress to enact legislation to protect all Americans' voting rights, legal standing, educational opportunities, and access to public facilities. He declared civil rights a moral issue for the United States and promised a bill that would give the kind of equality and treatment we would want for ourselves. What's so profound about that speech is he was talking to white people. Give black people what we would want for ourselves. The next day, in the wee hours of the morning of June 12th, Mega Evers, field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi, was assassinated in the driveway of his own home. All these things happened in this crucible of just you know, a day and a half or so. Nine days later, 244 lawyers answered a call from President Kennedy and the symbol in the East Room of the White House. He asked, where are the lawyers? What can you do? And he did so not knowing who would show up because, you know, the American Bar Association and a number of the you know, leading intellectuals or scholars, they would talk about the race problem as if they would, that's the terms people were using. They would talk about it as something distant, not about the real impacts on real people. But there was something that happened in that crucible of time. Now, some say it was President Kennedy's uh, heroic leadership and foresight. Some say he wanted to take the battle out of the streets and into the courts because they were worried about a long, hot summer to come and the type of uprisings or some say riots that happened in the mid and late 1960s. But he, he made this call and 244 lawyers answered, but mostly white lawyers. But there were 40 black lawyers in the room, which is notable in 1963. Okay, and so these lawyers answered the call. Now, I like to, and, and that of course meeting was the foundation, the creation of what became known as the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, the organization I now lead. Now, I like to think that the Lawyers Committee then, over the last 60 years, almost 61 and now, wasn't just about how can we get some lawyers together to do some charitable work, some pro bono work, volunteer here and there, that's cute. I like to think of the founding of the Lawyers Committee and our entire enterprise as a political project, at least an implicit political project, in at least two dimensions. One is that even though President Kennedy's own brother, Bobby Kennedy, was the Attorney General of the United States, JFK understood that we needed a peaceful army of private attorneys general to leverage civil rights laws if we're actually going to wage the battle on another battlefront. Now, it wasn't new that courts were being used. Obviously, we were several years after Brown, Brown v. Board, Charles Hamilton Houston, um, you know, had, had, had done so much, Thurgood Marshall had done so much, uh, Constance Baker Motley, all these folks were, the giants were already active, but it wasn't a lot of folks. And the private bar hadn't been mobilized in a substantial and sustained way. And so the part of the project was to make the bet that private attorneys general in at scale could make a difference. We believe we've made good on that bet. In the last decade alone, we've leveraged one million hours of pro bono service from law firms around the country for racial justice litigation, 
often leading edge for volunteering through the Election Protection Coalition. We, we convene the coalition at the Lawyers Committee and the Election Protection Hotline, a 66 hour vote. We have volunteers from the NBA, from law schools, what have you, all around the country. In the 2020 election cycle, about a quarter million voters called the hotline. And now you can call or text or go online, right? People had questions about where do I vote? What do I do? Which seems simple, but in the post Shelby County uh, Voting Rights Act world where your polling site keeps changing every election and there's nothing that can really be done about it, at least quickly, that matters a lot. But also we get a lot of reports of voter intimidation. I'll deviate quickly just to say, give an example of a case that just settled finally today, a case from the 2020 election to show you, give you a sense of how slowly the wheels of justice turn in their totality. In that election, obviously, we're in the teeth of the pan global pandemic. Um, obviously, you know, former President Trump was running for re-election against Biden. And so there was a lot of, you know, political heat, a lot of it partisan, some of it nonpartisan. There was a lot of energy. There was also a lot of confusion, a lot of sadness, a lot of illness, a lot of death. I lost my own father to COVID just the following year, right? And so there was a lot going on at that time. And so these two, uh, how can I call them? <laughs> They're on the spectrum of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of, uh, they're just, they're not good people, put it that way. <laughs> put it that way. They decided, hey, we want to influence this election, so it seems. And so they hired a voice actor, who we later learned was a black woman, to record a script. And they sent out 85,000 robocalls trying to target black voters. And I'll paraphrase, and then I'll directly quote. The paraphrase is, did you know that if you vote by mail, that the information will be used against you by creditors to collect outstanding debts, that the information will be used by police to execute outstanding warrants, that the information will be used by the CDC to force mandatory vaccinations, and the kicker line was don't give your information to the man. See, this is why we need election protection. This is why we need litigation. Because we talk a lot about what state actors do, but these are private actors, and they did it on a cheap, it cost them less than $10,000 to hit 85,000 people. So this is, this is horrific. Now today, powered by artificial intelligence, they could tar target black voters with surgical precision, and they can clone the voice of some of your favorite people. They could clone my voice. They could clone Professor Powell. They could clone Morgan Freeman, Oprah Winfrey. In the New Hampshire primary, Joe Biden's voice was cloned. Not for the same reasons, but similar type of strategy, right? So this, this, is, this is real stuff, right? So we do a lot of that work at the Lawyers Committee as we leverage the, the, the private bar. But the other part of the implicit political project, the second part, was this notion that a then racially integrated in the black-white binary, but today very racially diverse staff at our organization and board, that a multiracial group could actually come together focused on the lived experience of black people as I center in our core and not deviate from that in ways where you become like, you know, doing important work, but work that is not racial justice focused and civil rights focused. That's a big political project. That takes work inside of our organization to have a multiracial group because people come with different lived experiences, right? So that, that, that's what we're about at the Lawyers Committee. In terms of some of the things we do, I mentioned artificial intelligence, digital justice, we call it, we have a unit on that. We have a James Byrd Jr. Center to Stop Hate, named in honor of the late James Byrd who was killed by white supremacists in Jasper, Texas, the same summer I was an intern at the Lawyers Committee, 26 year, I think years ago. Uh, we do a lot of voting rights work, litigation, election protection, what have you. We're also right now doing a lot on the attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We stood at what we call the Protecting and Advancing DEI Pro Bono Initiative. We've leveraged six law firms to advise about three dozen clients. There are small nonprofits, there are scholarship programs, there are pipeline programs, even a couple of public charities who both raise money and grant money because they have either been threatened or they've been asked even by their own funders or by lawmakers, receive one of those threat letters, right? What are you doing with your program? Is this only for blacks? 
only for brown people. So a group of foundations came together and decided they wanted to create a pot of money to give those organizations money to pay law firms to defend themselves. We said, no, nah, don't do that. Let us help. So we leveraged these pro bono firms. We leveraged their pro bono, their free for the public good resources, working alongside our lawyers to help advise these clients. So we also argued the affirmative action case, the UNC and Harvard case in the Supreme Court. Uh, we've done, we're done a lot on police accountability as well, especially at the federal level, just to give you kind of a flavor for what we do. Our contemporary mission at the Lawyers Committee is to work inside and outside the courts to ensure that black people primarily and other people of color have the voice, the opportunity, and the power to make the promises of democracy real. And we say that because otherwise the promise of democracy are just illusory, it's just words on paper. And in our case, our version of democracy is a multiracial democracy, the most complicated political project and most important political project of all. So voice opportunity and power are critical components for who we are as an organization in terms of our identity, but also what we do, because all of these things are very important to build that multiracial democracy. I think they're important when you think about the context of this nation. So put aside notions of post-racialism and what's really you know, a harm and what's not, we'll talk about that. But just think about this. As long as there have been, as long as there's been public education in this country, at least public, I won't even go private, as long as there's been public education, there's been racial discrimination in education. As long as there have been elections in this country, there's been racial discrimination in voting. As long as there's been law enforcement in this country, there's been racial discrimination by police. In fact, that's exactly why police, as many of you know, were created, right? So this is why we need not just awareness, but activism. That's why we need not only diagnosis, but also prescriptions and remedies. And my friends, those remedies will not work unless they key in on the realities. Our past was race conscious. I submit that our present is race conscious, and I think that going forward, our future must be race conscious as well. It is inevitable. Now, in all of the type of attacks that we've heard about, the higher ed admissions cases, uh, and what, what have you, there are the, the, a lot of notions that are fallacious because they don't match our lived experience. I think probably most people in this room. Now I've had the blessing, some say the curse, of playing some small, sometimes a large role in every one of the higher ed affirmative action cases to go to the Supreme Court in the last 20 years. I caught um, a good shift or a tough shift, right? I was a, was a baby lawyer uh, when the Michigan affirmative action cases were argued, I worked on amicus briefs at the Legal Defense Fund when I worked there, uh, was the co-lead for all the amicus briefs, about 75 of them, in the Fishery v. UT Austin case about uh, a little over a dozen years ago. Uh, and of course, our team litigated the UNC and Harvard cases from the trial level all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, for close to a decade. And then of course, uh, our uh, lawyer David Hinojosa argued on behalf of black and brown students from UNC in the Supreme Court. And that was a tough law. So I've, I've seen these cases develop. But there are also, they're also cases in other realms, some of them of rarely, relatively recent vintage. They hit all facets of black life and American life. E economic, educational, opportunity, social services. There's a case about debt relief. The American Rescue Plan, remember that? Had lots of money rolling out the door to get people and communities back on their feet. That was the intent. There was also a provision that provided targeted debt relief to black farmers who are systematically discriminated against as a class. That debt relief was challenged in court. In fact, in 12 different courts, federal courts around the country, we intervened on behalf of black farmers, and in particular the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which I believe also has a presence here in Kentucky, uh, to, try to, ch to try to challenge the challenge, as they say. It's hit medical services. There was a provision in Medicaid, uh, there are provisions in Medicaid that provide bonus points and payments to doctors if they meet certain performance indicate, indicators, providers in the language of Medicaid. And so we know that there are structural inequalities in delivery of health and access to health care. And so 
Medicaid was planning to provide bonus points to doctors who develop plans, not even implemented, but just developed a plan to have it what you could call non-discriminatory uh, uh, outreach and treatment. And so that was challenged in court in Mississippi and a few other jurisdictions as well. It's hit government contracting. Two significant losses in federal court you should know about. They're at the trial court level, not on appeal, and I don't think they will go on appeal, but we'll see. One is about the Small Business Administration Section 8A program. You call it your standard minority contracting program in the language of SBA. Uh, there was also a challenge against the Minority Business Development Agency, and they were very much related because the 8A program has in its regulations and its plan uh, provisions to provide opportunities and access to businesses that are socially and economically disadvantaged. And there was a legal presumption built in that if you are a business majority owned by Native, Black, Asian, and I think in one of the cases, at least in the, MB, in the Minority Business Development Agency, even uh, s certain communities of Jewish people, that you are presumptively socially and economically disadvantaged because of what this nation has done to people, because of what's happening in the marketplace today. Both of those programs have been enjoined now from the Small Business Administration and the Minority De uh, Business Development Agency. This also hit private contracting. Many of you have heard about the Fearless Fund. It's a venture capital fund focused on black women. And I forget the actual percentage because it's less than a percentage point of how much venture capital black women are able to leverage in this country. It was a very modest, very important program, but very modest because the grants were in the small tens of thousands of dollars, maybe 10 to 20,000 if I understand correctly. Yet that was handpicked handpicked for legal attack as if it was an unfair advantage to black women because we know black women control all wealth in this country. Right? <laughs> These are the kind of attacks that we have been, that we've been seeing. And I talked about what we're doing at the Lawyers Committee about the, with the DEI initiative. We also stood up a partnership with a group called the Government Alliance on Racial Equity, which is a coalition that has many different cohorts, but one cohort is for city solicitors, city attorneys, county attorneys, because you see these types of DEI and other type of programs, not just in corporate workplaces or in the federal government, you also see them in local and county government too, and they're often under attack. And we wanna make sure that these local government attorneys, if you're righteous and you want to do right by our communities, that you have a place to turn. So we're working with Gary to set up a community of practice of these folks for mutual sharing, and learning and also provide them some tools and some support as well. We're also working with the California Endowment in California who, like many philanthropies, or, uh, help provide resources to their grantees to conduct reviews of their programs. They have hundreds of grantees throughout California, so we're working alongside other organizations to help those organizations analyze their plans. When we do advisory work, we don't just try to manage risk and liability. That's a classic lawyer thing. You have to look at that, but we want to leverage possibility. What's still lawful, which is a lot, right? People go around talking about DEI is dead, and that's just a very powerful and sometimes effective rhetorical device because the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action had nothing to do with DEI whatsoever. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in the workplace, is actually a way to comply with your obligations of the federal law your non-discrimination obligations under Title VII, your equal opportunity obligations. If you dismantle all DEI programs, you are probably a short walk to a devolution of culture, a short walk towards a hostile work environment, and a short walk to legal liability. And we're probably gonna to have to redouble efforts to start suing some of these companies that are backtracking on their efforts. So there are two people at the epicenter of a lot of these attacks on anti-DEI, and I won't even go into detail on anti-critical race theory, because I'm a critical race theory student. When I was a law student, I brought Derrick Bell to our campus. I read articles by Kim Crenshaw that are still over my head, and now she's a friend for the last 20 years. Professor Paul Butler, all kinds of scholars who've done this work. But there are two people at the episode a lot of this. One is Ed Blum, and the other is Stephen Miller. Now, we know both of these folks well, and 
even if you don't know them by name, you know their handiwork. So Stephen Miller is an alum of the Trump White House. He's the guy who devised all of the anti-immigrant stuff. He's doing a lot of anti-LGBT, uh, LGBTQ stuff, a lot of anti-trans stuff around the country right now. Uh, and Ed Blum, of course, he bankrolled the, a few different important cases, the UNC and Harvard litigation. He bankrolled and developed a strategy there. He's caught on tape saying we need to find Asians because he knew he got his hat handed to him in the Fisher v. UT Austin case, which he also bankrolled over a decade earlier, where he propped up young Abigail Fisher. I feel bad for her because she says she wasn't admitted to UT Austin because of race, because there's a preference for black and Latino students. When in fact, even under the, me the, the narrow measures that the school used, she wasn't even qualified. Just straight up. So he lost that case, but he bankrolled that case. But he also bankrolled another case, the one I referred to earlier, the Shelby County versus Holder case that gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act. You see, there are people, these folks are saying that they're against racial preferences. They're not. I don't think anyone has a racial preference, like I only want to see black people live or thrive. That's my preference. No, nobody really does that. If you, there may be some people out there like that, but I don't think they're around here. They're not against racial preferences. They're actually against racial justice, racial pro progress, racial equity. That's what I believe they're against. The thing that ties those cases together is really an underlying legal theory. And I'm going to read to you a mission statement from Stephen Miller's group, America First Legal. They say prominently on their website, America First Legal is the long-awaited answer to the ACLU. We are committed to an unwavering defense of true equality under law, national borders and sovereignty, freedom of speech and religion, classical values and virtues, the sanctity of life and the centrality of family, and so on and so on. But the money phrase is true equality under the law. Now, Thurgood Marshall would have said, yeah, I want true equality under the law. Kind of Speaker Motley would say that. The founders of the Lawyers Committee 61 years ago would have said, we want true equality under the law. And for a long time at the Lawyers Committee, our mission statement and language was about securing equal rights for all. You see that some of the language in the freeze above the Supreme Court, right? Equal justice, equal rights, yes. But as Professor Powell knows well, because I feel like I'm cribbing from his work, there's such a notion as a formalistic legal equality that not only fails to cognize, but ignores, frankly, erases notions of structural racism that the dean spoke about earlier. Structural inequality, right? That's really important. This is not a new view or analysis, but it's gained new energy and, 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 and thrust. Think about these two quotes. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating based on race. Eliminating, right, you can laugh too. Eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. You know, a generation ago, that was someone like, yeah, that's a civil rights lawyer. But no, that is your Chief Justice John Roberts. The second quote is his, uh, his, his, uh, I guess part two, his sequel to the first one, but the part two was from the UNC and Harvard cases. The part one was from a case that many of you know. It was the case that we know as parents involved. The case that was, Seattle case that was consolidated with the case here in Louisville about voluntary integration of schools. Leveraging race to bring people together, not to keep them apart. So this formal legalistic equality does not, in some of the views of some, does not allow us to actually understand race and racism to bring people together. Those are not the words of a civil rights lawyer. And it's not the essence of a civil rights lawyer, but in both of the cases, just Chief Justice Roberts writes these long passages about Brown v. Board of Education, which is the moral compass for civil rights law. It's the kind of thing that, uh, Laura, that pr pr professor, that we would chase, right? Uh, what are you said there? 
uh, with Chase, the next Brown. Like, how do we make a big impact through law as education attorneys and advocates? But here's the interesting thing. Those two passages I read, the, uh, the opinion writer Jamel Bowie with the New York Times had a really interesting observation. So I, I think a lot of us had it, but he really encapsulated it well. He talked about how in those two quotes, the thing that Roberts talks about race, but not racism. Race, but not racism. Racial discrimination he talks about, but not racism. And it's not just rhetoric. He wrote a piece that he called the John Roberts two-step, and I'm gonna quote Jamel Bowie. He says, this you might say is the Roberts two-step. He takes racism, a system of subjugation and social control, and removes the racists. What's left is the mark of racism that is race. And I would add race itself. A landmark case about the legitimacy of race hierarchy, Brown v. Board of Education, becomes in Roberts' hands a case about the use of race in school placement. To remove racism and racists from the equation is to pretend that there's no social force to push against, no inequality to rectify. Instead, there's only a squishy quality of race that Robert says the Constitution cannot recognize. The result is a society that continues to reinforce and reconstitute these previous patterns of domination, except hierarchy is now hidden from law, and what is a feature of society instead becomes rather instead a quality of the people afflicted. So the irony that we see in civil rights litigation and advocacy is that it's actually much harder for us to prove anti-black racism, yet it's much easier for our opponents to claim that anything that's race conscious is somehow violative of law and the Constitution at that. The Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution is not only being used to attack outright racial classifications, it's also being used to challenge mechanisms and policies and practices that are entirely race neutral in their intent, their design, their mechanic, but race conscious in how they're trying to promote opportunity. Two recent examples, one is Thomas Jefferson High School in Virginia, not far, Northern Virginia, not far from DC. This high school, like many of the elite public high schools with a certain admission requirements, very, very white and also increasingly very, very Asian in terms of the composition. That's not problematic that white students and Asian students get, get opportunity. The problem is black and brown students don't. And so the school used race neutral mechanisms. Not, it wasn't an affirmative action program. It wasn't even a top 10% program. It was race neutral mechanisms to shift testing requirements to say, you know what? We can be a great school, but we don't need these particular requirements. They shifted the metrics. They were sued, and fortunately they prevailed. Just recently, in the last couple of weeks, the Lawyers Committee joined Latino Justice, uh, formerly known as the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund, to file an amicus brief on behalf of a Smithsonian institution, the National Museum of the American Latino. Now, this museum hasn't even been built yet. But as you know, with Smithsonian, they get started years ahead, and they even have an internship program. The internship program recognized that there are not many Latinos who are doing curation work in our nation's museums, and they created an internship program that was actually entirely race neutral in its mechanic to promote and expose people, young Latinos and, and others, who are quote unquote underrepresented. I say quote unquote because I don't like underrepresented because someone's underrepresented and someone else is overrepresented, but that's a whole other lecture another time. But at any rate, they were sued by an Ed Blum group. And he has, by the way, not just one organization that sued in higher ed, which is called Students of Fair Admissions, one of the false, most fallacious names out there, he has almost like shell companies, like Trump-like shell companies. They have different names. Always these innocuous sounding names. Anyway, that suit quickly settled. And it didn't settle because the museum capitulated. It settled because they had no grounds to go on. You know what the settlement says? The, the museum has to put on its website that their program is not only for Latinos. It was never only for Latinos, right? So the point is they're using the law, they're weaponizing the law to go after programs that are trying to promote opportunity but are even race neutral in their mechanic. Now, again, back to Brown. What was the issue there? Forced separation of people by race. That's now being conflated with efforts that are leveraging race to bring people together, as I've said. The law is metastasizing so much 
is getting so out of control that we are essentially as advocates being pushed into a small corner of a room. Think about a room of advocacy this big. We're being pushed into that corner. We're being left with very little. And it feels real, doesn't feel good to just defend, defend, defend and have, you know, wins that feel elusive and few and far between. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some, some, of this, some of this piece here, but I do want to mention why is this happening? Part of it is that there's a capture with respect to the notion of colorblindness. We've seen it come up in all the cases I've mentioned, especially the higher ed cases. If you have not read Nicole Hannah-Jones piece, her essay in the New York Times recently called The Colorblindness Trap, I encourage you to do so. Other scholars call it colorblind racism because of the impact that it has. Uh, long story short, Washington v. Davis, the Supreme Court case from 1976, adopted what we know as the intent requirement to prove racial discrimination under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, it must allege and prove intentional racial discrimination. You can do that in a couple of ways. You can show a racial classification, even if it's a compelling interest, if it's not narrowly tailored, too bad, so sad, or you can show intent to discriminate in other ways. You can also build a circumstantial case of intent. We won't get into that today. But the intent requirement is really tough because it actually allows to stand lots of policies and practices that are I believe anti-democratic, I think anti-meritocratic as well, if you want to get down to it, that hurt a lot of people. Three quick cases. New York City has elite high schools too. They call them the specialized high schools. Bronx Science, Brooklyn Tech, and Stuyvesant, the one people know about. Now, when I worked in New York for about 10 years, my office was like a walk to Stuyvesant. I was in Tribeca. And I would see the students going to the school and I would also read about the admissions. And it turns out that out of thousands of students who would apply each year and the hundreds who were admitted, because freshman classes were like a few hundred students, there would often be single digits of black students. Like, what is up with that, I would wonder? So we started talking to advocates around the city and it turns out that the sole criterion to determine who's admitted to the schools is a score on a single test. And it turns out that test hadn't been validated to predict who does well in the school. One of the experts we spoke to said the test does a really good job of predicting who does well in the test. That's the criterion. You could have straight A's. You could be an Olympic gold medalist, as some teenagers are. You could save mama from a speeding train. None of that matters. It's just about your score in the test that doesn't actually predict your success. We could not bring an intent claim because we didn't have enough, enough evidence for it. We had to focus on the disparate impact theory, which for reasons I won't go into, wasn't available to us in federal court. We had to file a complaint with the US Department of Education. We filed that complaint in 2012, Laura, you know that one. And it hasn't been resolved yet. It hasn't been resolved yet. Another case, we call it the road home case in my home state of Louisiana, another one I worked on that I think uh, uh, Laura mentioned earlier. After Hurricane Katrina, Louisiana created a housing recovery program. It was the single largest housing uh, recovery grant program in the nation's history at that time. Billions of dollars. But here's how it worked. Homeowners will receive money to repair their homes, either the cost to repair the damage or the pre-storm market value, whichever was lower. Now on this face you think, oh yeah, you don't want to give people more money than the home is worth, so sure. But here's the problem. New Orleans has very similar housing, ranch style houses. We don't, we're below the water table so we don't dig, right? So you could have a nearly identical house, same developer even, and a majority white neighborhood and a majority black neighborhood. Turns out the market says the house in the majority white neighborhood is always worth more. The market discriminates. So there was a built-in discriminatory criterion. We had a partial victory and partial loss in federal district court in DC before someone who happened to be a black judge, Judge Kennedy, and then went on appeal to the DC circuit. And that was ugly because questions came from the bench about, well, you're talking about disparate impact on black people, what about white people? That really came up. And you know who was on that panel? Kavanaugh. Now Justice Kavanaugh was on that, but he didn't write the opinion, but he was on that panel. So we were frustrated in our efforts. Now we did get $500 million in the settlement, but we didn't have the resounding victory that should have frankly been a couple of billion for homeowners who were being deprived. 
this is not a case example. What I want to talk about is how these principles play out in the higher education context, just briefly. And I'll just tell a quick story. The former dean of the law school I attended, maybe 15 years ago, wrote a letter to alumni. I don't know why deans write those really long letters. I don't know why. But it was, you don't do that? Okay. So it was, it was, it was a good letter. But I actually read this one, right? And I know the, the point is, we're great, give us money. I understand. You got to do, you got to support your school, right? But in this letter, he was touting the success of the school. And he wrote about how the median LSAT score was so high. In fact, he said the score is so high, I don't think I would have even been admitted. And what really struck me was he was equating success with a certain form of eliteness. In fact, it was equating success with exclusion. This is a Yale-educated lawyer, clerk for Judge Higginbotham. And I wouldn't have been admitted because the scores are so high. Why should that be our metric for what success looks like, for what merit looks like? And see, here's the problem with all of these examples in the space where disparate impact isn't available to us or not cognized by the courts. The harm is the justice, injustice goes unaddressed, but the harm is even deeper because when racially disparate impacts are ignored, it hurts not only, or influences not only what people are willing to expect, but what people accept. In these cases, it's not just the inequitable results. If the results are legally okay, then whose fault is it that the results are happening? It's the fault of the people being harmed. That's the logic. Black and brown high school students, black and brown college applicants, black homeowners. In my class TV camp, it was black people who were convicted of murder. It doesn't matter that you're more likely to get the death penalty if you're a black person who was convicted of killing a white person as opposed to a white person killing a black person or a black person killing a black person. It doesn't matter, it's your fault that you're in this situation. Your circumstance is not only your own problem, they're your own fault. So this is really about narratives, about who's deserving, who belongs, who's worthy of empathy, who gets a say, who has a voice who's worthy of a second chance. And you know who believes in these racialized narratives? Sure, there's many white people who have racial anxiety, I'm sure, about shifting demographics and the shifting landscape of opportunity in this wacky economy. There's also Asian people who are used as pawns, I believe, by Ed Blum. There's also a lot of black people, too. You know, in a specialized high schools matter in New York City, when we filed that complaint, we expected there to be a, a theory that, well, you're anti-Asian because you don't like the fact that so many Asian students are there. We were prepared for that, and so we had as our clients many Asian American or grassroots organizations who worked alongside us. What we weren't prepared for were black alumni of Stuyvesant who said, you got it wrong. These students aren't ready. I was ready, but they're not. See, we all sometimes believe in these racialized narratives about merit. So how do we find our way out of this mess? We're being tested in ways we've never been tested, so we need approaches that we haven't had before. Maybe some we have had before, but haven't used in a while. You're familiar with Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War. It lasted only a dozen years, but it was pretty important. Brought my home state of Louisiana, is first and only black governor. First only, I'm not sure we had a statewide black elected official since then, actually, in Louisiana. So Reconstruction lasted for a while until the compromise that removed federal troops, and then we had 100 years of Jim Crow after that. There was a second Reconstruction in the Civil Rights era, the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voter Rights Act of 65, Fair Housing Act, EEOC in the early 70s, early affirmative action. It was part of a second Reconstruction. And what those two had in common is, in different ways, there were fundamental restructurings of the legal political, social relationship between and among Americans and also between Americans and the state, meaning the government. 13, 14, 15 amendments in the first Reconstruction, second Reconstruction, landmark legislation. So my friends, we need a third Reconstruction. It's time to fundamentally restructure the relationships between and among Americans and relations between us and the state. So what should be some of the facets of this third reconstruction? First, modern day discrimination remand, demands modern day ways to address it and stop it. 
I think we have to get back to the real underpinning of Brown. It wasn't just about a racial classification. It was actually about racial subordination, about signaling and developing structures to tell people that you are less than, even if things were facially equal. Subordination or anti-subordination. Second, I think a broad coalition will be crucial to durability. I spoke about when do we have all of these things happening at once, the, the attacks, the racialized attacks, but also the peaceful demonstrations of multiracial, intergenerational, interfaith. I think that's what a lot of the backlash is about, frankly. That's why they say our kids are being indoctrinated, because they're afraid of that great coming together, that great calling in. But we need that kind of coalition going forward. And we need everyone, regular, everyday folks, working people, corporate leaders, to leverage all forms of capital, fiscal, put some financial capital into it, capital, human capital, volunteer for the election protection hotline or volunteer in your community, not just for service, which is important, but for activism. Activism, Ms. Palmer. But also leverage reputational capital. Because you gotta put something on the line to challenge attacks on DEI in the state. You gotta put something on the line to testify before Congress, as I've done a number of times. Because I know I'll never be confirmed as a judge. If I want to be a judge, that's not my aspiration, but they'll pick all the highlights of all the things that I said here and everywhere. Right? You've got to put something on the line, not recklessly, but boldly. But third, we also need a new narrative. Every movement needs a narrative. What is our narrative going to be? I would submit that our narrative should be one where we're not asking or even demanding in a way that suggests we're, we just want to take it. Take it meaning justice, opportunity, what have you. I want you to close your eyes for a sec if you're comfortable doing so. Think about all the things you want for your family, for your children, for your cousins, for your community. For me, it's things like safety from police violence and white vigilante violence. It is economic security. Maybe I have something to pass to my kids. Maybe. Maybe it's having a career as I have and not just a job where I'm scrapping to get by, working multiple shifts. Maybe it's health. And open your eyes. All the things that you want are not just wishes. If you don't have them in the present, that's the future you're imagining. But my friends, it's a future you deserve. We have to believe in the narrative that we deserve the things that we're, we're looking for. And we have to go out and claim those things as well. I think that's important. As, as important as the, as the legal piece is, we have to believe in the narrative and frame these new narratives, the future we deserve. I'm going to close with a quote from a really ironic source from Lyndon Baines Johnson, successor to JFK. And it's ironic because he was a hero in many ways. He used personal political capital and reputational capital to get the Civil Rights Act passed, and the Voting Rights Act as well. But he also liked to use the N-word, impolite company, or impolite company. So, but there's something he said that I think is really important. When we think about the juxtaposition of formal legal equality, which Professor Powell's written and spoken so aptly about, versus the future we deserve, he kind of sums it up. At a commencement address at Howard in the mid-60s, he said, we seek not just legal equality, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. As a civil rights activist and lawyer, I don't want to just be in the work in the game. I want to deliver results for our people, for all of our people. That's what our eyes should be on, my friends, the future that we deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Damien Hewitt for these inspiring, provocative, insightful, 
and empowering remarks, and we have a gift for you for your remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. I have the honor and privilege of presenting the Daryl T. Owens Community Service Award. And the recipient this year is J. Michael Brown, and his family will receive it in his honor uh, posthumously. I want to make a connection, not uh, make a lot of remarks, but the reason we thought of this award is we're thinking about generational leadership. And one of the major things that uh, Daryl T. Owens stood for was his dedication to public service, civil rights. He was an attorney. He broke racial barriers by becoming the first black person to gain recognition on many fronts, including assistant prosecutor for the Louisville Police Court, Kentucky Attorney General, Jefferson County Commissioner, former NAACP president, longtime state legislator, and trusted colleague and great friend in this community. And I want to publicly acknowledge uh, Brenda Owens, who always comes with us uh, to celebrate the great achievements and legacy of Daryl T. Owens. I mentioned generational leadership, and J. Michael Brown was a preeminent public servant and Renaissance man, a life led full time in achievement and empowerment. He was a helicopter pilot, a captain in the 101st Division at Fort Campbell. He was a district judge and the rare public official who serves in the judiciary, legislative, and executive branches. He was a native New Yorker, graduate of Bronx High School of Science, the first African-American LBA president, law firm partner at Stites and Harbison and Wyatt, Taron and Combs, Law Director of Louisville, Assistant Commonwealth Attorney, Board Chair of Louisville Regional Airport, Secretary to the first uh, Governor Bashir uh, in Public Safety, and Secretary Executive Cabinet for this Governor Bashir, the current Governor Bashir from 2019 to 2022. He was a recipient in 2015 of the Nelson Mandela Award presented by the Department of Public Advocacy. And he was, at the time of his untimely passing, Director of Pre-Law and Constitutional Studies at Simmons College, and a mentor to generations of attorneys, who some of who are in this audience. I feel like I've come full circle. I just want to mention the, the first time I met J. Michael Brown, one of the first people I met in Louisville uh, he invited us over to his house, uh, and he lived in old Louisville, and I keep everything. So J. Michael Brown made me a mambo tape, a, a black uh, Cuban, and I've kept it to this day, and it says mambo. Uh, and it's crazy. We spent the whole night talking about things, and he, and he had a very wry sense of humor. He would look at you, and sometimes you didn't get the joke, but when you thought about it, you'd say, Oh, yeah, that is funny. There's this nice edge of cynicism. But what really struck me about J. Michael Brown was he was always quietly understated, but always empowering. In fact, our last discussion uh, was on Constitution Day, and we were talking about a fully functioning democracy. And many of the brilliant remarks that Damon Hewitt made echoed in our conversation that day. He was very concerned about post-racial constitutionalism, constitutional neutrality, subordination, and how it was undermining our democracy, and where will we go from here. But it's always inspiring when you meet someone like that to understand what they're saying to you and try to preserve their legacy. And that's what we're trying to do at the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. For all my colleagues, especially uh, Dr. Laura McNeil, uh, all of our colleagues are dedicated to dismantling a structural inequality, and that's why we have the Breonna Taylor Lecture. So I'll talk, stop talking and bring up uh, J. Michael Brown's family so I can award the 2024 Daryl T. Owens Community Service Award.
This is uh, William Brown and Robin White Chisholm. short words. When, when you mentioned Bronx Science, my dad graduated from Bronx Science, so we were, ch we were chuckling there for a minute. Uh, my dad loved Louisville. My dad loved U of L. Uh, Mrs. Owens and I were talking. It's been, let's see, I'm 50, 40 plus years we've seen each other. We were reflecting back when we were all in Dallas, Texas in 1986 for the national championship game. That's how far back we go. I'm truly honored to accept this for him. Those that know, this was very untimely, very unexpected. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to accept this for him. Mrs. Taylor, we had many discussions about your daughter when things happened over the phone. We, we communicated a lot about the whole situation. That other individual, never walked down the hall to talk to my father. He knew not to come to his office. I apologize that that man didn't do his job for your daughter. Thank you. We, uh, on behalf of the family, of my uncle, J. Michael Brown. Um, we moved here in 1980, March. <laughs> so we got thrown into March Madness and U of L, and we didn't know anything about that coming from New York because we have everybody's team up there. So we knew nothing about college basketball. Um, but he was a student here at U of L and graduated that same year from Brandeis Law. Um, we, I'm being the oldest, was very proud of everything that I saw uh, growing up with my uncle. My first time voting uh, was a presidential election and he was running for judge. And of course I got to pass out flyers and do all of that. So my affiliation with uh, knowing what law is, knowing what voting rights are, and I've not missed an election since. I am proud to be here on behalf of the family. Um, I want to thank you for this award. He loved Brandeis Law. He loved UofL. He loved Louisville. And he loved it so much that he bought all of us here <laughs> to, as transplants, because 1980s was not a place to raise teenage kids at that particular time. So uh, we all loved it here. Several of my family members graduated from Bronx High School of Science, by the way. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, it, they were, that's the first time we knew what magnet schools were. That's the, they were the equivalent of what a magnet school is. And there are places here, same thing. Test scores don't get you in to a good school. So we're, we're still fighting that battle with my grandchildren now, my children and everything else, but I appreciate uh, the honor. Uh, we appreciate um, Brandeis School of Law. He loved this school. He loved your veil. And we just thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We thank you. I am that short. Um, okay, the fellows have been waiting patiently, as have their families, and how lucky am I that I get to tell you a little bit about them. Okay, so first I just wanna give you a little bit about the fellowship itself. The Brianna Taylor Legacy Fellowship was established in 2022 through a generous donation from artist Amy Sherald from the sale of her portrait of Ms. Brianna Taylor. 
This is the second year that the fellowships will be awarded. And I believe I see Jasmine and Maggie. Can you give a, a hand? Those are our first two fellows last year. Amazing. Thank you for being here tonight. So this is the second year that we're awarding the fellowships. The recipients had to complete a competitive process and demonstrate dedication to social justice work in the legal field. I am so excited to announce that Alexis Kamek, McKinley Butler, and Shirley Studemeyer are our three Brianna Taylor Legacy Fellows for 2024. Let's give them applause. We'll bring them up in a minute. Before we bring them up for a real big ovation, I would love for you to please turn your attention to the screen and hear from the fellows themselves. I'm McKinley Butler. My name is Shirley Studemeyer. And I'm Alexis Kamek. And, and we, we are, are the 2024 Brianna Taylor Legacy Fellows. To carry on Brianna Taylor's legacy in this fellowship, I'll be working with Kentucky Innocence Project, helping people who have been wrongfully convicted get out of jail and restart their lives, as well as working on policy changes to help juveniles in the way that police cannot lie to them and people who have been wrongfully convicted automatically get compensated once they are exonerated. This summer I will be working at the Legal Aid Society in their housing unit doing eviction defense work. Um, I did this work last summer and I got a lot out of it. I learned a lot so I'm really excited to do that this summer with the fellowship and just learn more and be able to help more people. I'll be working at the Kentucky Equal Justice Center this summer, working under a housing attorney, doing policy work and legal research, and just getting a better, better grasp on understanding um, the housing crisis in Louisville and working with tenants that are being treated unfairly by their landlords and doing what I can in my power to make sure that their rights are being upheld and respected. In 2020, when Breonna Taylor was murdered, um, I was, in the protest on the lines and it really, everything became real to me, I feel like. Um, seeing different types of people, different ages, different groups coming together and rallying for social justice, specifically racial inequality, was really significant for me. And I think that being a Breonna Taylor Fellow kind of embodies what I've been trying to do ever since I was walking in that protest in 2022. Um, serving my community, making sure people who do, don't have a voice are heard, and fighting for people's rights. Um, and that's, that's what I plan to do to carry on her legacy. So being a Breonna Taylor Legacy Fellow really means everything to me. Like I said, being biracial, growing up in the city of Louisville, um, this is home to me. And it's just a full circle moment Law school can be really difficult as a marginalized student um, and it's easy to lose track of why you come here and just with the different, you know, the academic part of it, it's easy to lose focus sometimes and this opportunity just reminds me of why I'm here and I don't take it for granted at all. It, it really means the world to me and to be able to accept it with two of my sisters that are from Louisville as well and feel as passionate about making change in this city as I do. It just, it's a great feeling and it, it's a full circle moment. Being selected as a Breonna Taylor Legacy Fellow is honestly, it means a lot to me and it's, a, it's an honor. Um, what happened to her should have never happened. It was a tragedy that shook our city. It makes me just want to go harder behind her name and that's how I'll carry on her legacy, doing everything that I can as a future I've member of the, the legal community of to make sure that what happened to her never the happens past again. Two years, they shine as future leaders. They're already leading. But as Professor Powell talked about intergenerational leadership, you absolutely see the leadership of these powerhouse women. Please 
fellows, come on up. We want to give you a round of applause. <laughs> McKinley Butler, Alexis Kamek, Shirley Studemeyer, please come on up. And I believe that we will have some closing remarks from Dr. Laura McNeil. No? Yes? Yes. Or we will have some remarks from Professor Powell. <laughs> Look at that change up. All right. <laughs> I won't say much, but I, I'll just summarize. Uh, we were talking about a fully functioning democracy. and. Damon Hewitt really underscored what we really need to do in this third reconstruction. The affirmative action decision that he talked about is really important because what has been happening over the last five to 10 years is that the US Supreme Court has been reading out the anti-subordination clause of the 14th Amendment. You all in my constitutional law two class just had this exercise and that's why I gave you this exercise so that you would know uh, what the court is doing. This notion of post-racial constitutionalism uh, is undermining our democracy. So recall and remember uh, Damon Hewitt's remarks, anti-subordination, coalition and activism, a new narrative, the things that we deserve are in our future, and fight against anti-democratic movements, which are multi-pronged, nefarious, and threaten to destroy our democracy anti-DEI, disbanding anything that mentions diversity, anti-woke, changing the narrative of empowerment to one of reverse discrimination, anti-black history, erasing everything that we can consider to determine the present day effects of past discrimination, anti-affirmative action, anti-busing to magnet schools, to reinforce segregated neighborhoods under the ostensibly neutral notion of freedom of choice and voluntary schooling. You see that all of these things are cloaked in the fake narrative of rhetorical neutrality. Our response should be empowerment and unity. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.